<clears throat> All right, I'd like to start off by saying Barakat Tehawa, Bahashem Yahu Shai, Bahashem, Racha Kudash. Welcome to another live lesson. The name of this one is Revelation chapter 20. And pretty much, you know, as you know, you know, we've been going back over the, the breakdowns, you know, for the sake of, you know, some of the younger um, viewers that are, that are, you know, um, watching and learning. Uh, to some brothers, this is, you know, you know, now it's basic stuff, but just remember that when you first started, how deep, you know, the things that you heard were, and that's how, you know, these individuals now that are coming in, you know, that are new, newer to the faith, that's how they feel now, you know, to get the information that brothers got before. So we're going to go through it, but before we get, get through it, um, this, the book of Revelation chapter 20, you know, the best way to explain it, it jumps back and forth in history. So you could say like a movie has a jump cut, you know, you're watching the scene and all of a sudden it stops and jumps to something else. Well, that's how Revelation is. There's other precepts in the scriptures that, that do that. You know, they kind of jump back and forth. Like uh, another example is Revelation, I'm sorry, not Revelation, Isaiah chapter 60. You know, it speaks about slavery. Then all of a sudden it's, it jumps to the chariots. Then it jumps back to slavery in the kingdom. So this is one of those uh, examples. Now, what I want to do to the spirit, you know, Yahweh Bashem Shai Ratiza, which means Yahweh in the name of his son Yahweh Shai's will. You know, I want to go to the to the breakdown, but I want to jump around in the chapter through the verses to kind of paint the picture together through the spirit. Because when you're reading this without understanding, you're thinking it's talking about all one set thing, you know. Uh, and it's not. You know, there are two periods of thousand years in this chapter, but if you don't understand that, you're gonna be confused and you're gonna be lost. So what I wanna do to the spirit is we're gonna read like the first three verses, break those down, then jump down to the seventh verse to the end of the chapter, and then we'll jump back up, Lord's will, to the beginning of the, you know, to the fourth verse and finish that out to you know to kind of give it some sense you know, of how it's written. So Revelation 21 and 20 and 1 says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, you know, you have the angel, right? You know the angel? Inside joke. It says, having the key of the bottomless pit. All right. The bottomless pit is a representation of a place. And that place is not talking about hell because you have these so-called Christians that teach us talking about hell. They ain't talking about hell. It ain't talking about no Apollyon being in hell. You know, those are all wives' fables, Jewish wives' fables. Um, the pit is talking about a land, a plot of land, in particular Europe, right? And the reason why it's known as the bottomless pit is because there is a lack of, you know, mineral resources in those regions. This is why a lot of stuff has to be imported into Europe from uh, like spices and different fruits and vegetables and things of that nature from these different countries that have the climate, you know, to grow these things. All right. Um, so when we go to Second Ezra chapter five, verse 24, it says, and of all lands, let you, letting you know they're speaking about lands of the whole world thou hast chosen thee one pit and of all the flowers thereof one lily so one pit means what one particular place what is that place talking about because it's speaking about lands out of all the lands of the earth the lord chose one pit what is that one pit jerusalem the land of israel especially jerusalem all right and that's going to come into play a little later on you know, uh, as we go through the chapter. So going back to Revelation 20 and 1, and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit. Bottomless pit be in Europe. All right, the key is the ability to open the door or to close it, 
right? And a great chain in his hand. This great chain is a representation of slavery, all right? One good priest that we could go to is in the book of Psalms, 149th chapter, where it speaks about the nobles and the kings of this nation, of these nations out here, beginning with Esau, are gonna be carried away and carted off into slavery in chains, all right? They're nobles and fetters of iron, all right? So there's a representation of uh, a captivity, but a long captivity. That's why I said a great chain, because this, this, once this thing happened back then, you know, it was it was for a period of a long time, right? So it says, and he, uh, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound them a thousand years. So that thousand years is the first thousand year and that is that great chain all right and that thousand years began when jake started to rule right and jake started to rule the roman empire right after 96 a.d or around 96 a.d right after the last edomite uh emperor right ruled which was domitian from the flavian dynasty Okay, he was the last Edomite ruler, and when Jake came and took over the Roman Empire and conquered them, they were still ruling under the ancient pagan Roman ways. It wasn't until roughly around 325 AD when Constantine was on the throne that he made Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire. Okay, so we could really start our count around there, the thousand years into the future, because prior to that, Jake was still following the Roman pagan ways, even though Constantine was a pagan, a sun worshiper. He incorporated a lot of those pagan worships into the Christian church, but he gave the uh, Christianity to the kingdom. That's what the, the religion that ruled the kingdom. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was his mother if I'm not mistaken, I believe her name was Helen, if I'm not mistaken. She was the one that, you know, pretty much encouraged him, you know, to, to do that. You know, you know my, the, the uh, history on that is a little vague because I haven't gone over that history in a long time. But that's roughly, you know, uh, um, so you can get a little picture of it. Or you can go and research it yourself. All right? So from that point on into the future, that's where it began that thousand year period, all right? And that thousand year period, you know, is known as, you could call it, they, some people call it the Dark Ages, some people call it the Byzantine Empire. And I've heard them say that the word Byzantine means backward, which I've you know, never come across that information, you know, that, that it meant backwards. But what I did come across uh, doing the research now, it was actually, Byzant Byzantium was actually called by a particular individual, right? So I, I'm here on Etymology Online, Byzant Byzant Byzantium, it says ancient Greek settlement in Thrace on the European side of Bosphorus, said to be named for its 7th uh, BCE founder, Bysus of Megara. So there was an individual named Bysus of Megara which is where Byzant Byzantium got its name from, which became the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire under Constantine, which later became, uh, um, which later became uh, Constantinople, uh, and later became Istanbul, Turkey. All right. So it says um, a place of little consequence until 330 CE when Constantine the Great refounded it and made it his capital. Then it says, see Constantinople, because that's what it was called. It was called Constantinople prior to the Arabs, you know, conquering it and renaming it Istanbul, Turkey. And it was really not even the, the uh, Arabs that conquered it. It was uh, the Ottoman Turks, which were Edomites that converted to the religion of Islam. Okay, so now let's go from there. Let's go to what I typed in, right? I typed in um, in the Google, 
in the Google, how long was the Dark Ages? Uh, how long was the Dark Ages, or something along those lines? And it says 900 years, right? But now, peep where they started their date from. Dark Ages usually refer to the 900 years of European history between the 5th and 14th century. The 5th century began with 401 AD, all right? And it ends in 500 AD, all right? So now, that was about 100 years, or close, about 70 years or so, right, in the future from when Constantine established Christianity as the new religion of, you know, the, uh, the, the Roman Empire, all right? But it's the, uh, it said there nine, uh, 900 years. So if you go back another 100 years, which would make it an even thousand, that would lead us or land us around the time when Constantine established Christianity as the, um, as the religion of the ancient Roman Empire. Now, I read somewhere before, I'm not sure if it was, I know it was in Wikipedia, I'm not sure if it was the Dark Ages or if it was something else, but I actually read an, a, a point in there that the, uh, the Dark Ages actually lasted uh, 1,000 years, say 1,000 years, all right? So that's just, you know, to give you, you know, some, some uh, history on that. Now, when we go to Dark Ages historiography, and also in Wikipedia, you can go to other sources, you know, just, this just happened to come up and I just, you know, it was concise. So I wanted to just, you know, use this. It says the Dark Ages is a term for the early Middle Ages or occasionally the entire Middle Ages in Western Europe after the fall of the Western Roman Empire that characterizes it as marked by an economic, intellectual, and cultural decline. The concept of a dark age as a histori historiographical periodization, which just means a period in history, originated in the 1330s. You getting it? Because when you go back a thousand years from that you got what 325 AD when Constantine set up and established Christianity as the religion of the Empire all right so it says with the Italian scholar Petrarch who regarded the post-Roman centuries as dark compared to the light of classical antiquity and it so happens that a thousand years into the future beginning in the mid around the mid 1300s especially as you get into the 14 15 especially the 1600s that's when you had a, uh, the the uh, renaissance period come into play and the renaissance period the word renaissance is a is a um, a french word re meaning back naissance means to be born so to be born again or rebirth the rebirth of what the rebirth of esau coming back on the scene because his kingdom was chopped down a thousand years before that and he was actually in that low condition or under that dark cloud for that period of a thousand years all right the term employs traditional light versus darkness imagery to contrast the error's darkness and this is what Esau is labeling it labeling it as ignorance and error with earlier and later periods of light knowledge and understanding the phrase dark ages itself derives from the latin seculum obscurum which is, means uh, a dark age seculum uh, seclorum eon iwalum all means age which is a certain time period of rulership then you have the word obscurum where you get the word obscure from or in spanish oscuro which means darkened or dark it says originally applied by Caesar Baronius in 1602. Now this is in the, in the heart of the uh, Renaissance period when he referred to a tumultuous period in the 10th and 11th centuries. The concept thus came to characterize the entire Middle Ages at the time of intellectual darkness in, in Europe. But remember, this was just that was just based off of a period from 1000 to 1100 
idea, a certain situation that was going on back then, right? So they ended up applying that to the whole thing. Why? Because at that time, Esau was really in darkness. And it was a dark age to them because so-called black people were ruling. Israelites were ruling all throughout Europe. You know, and when you go and you do your research, you see a lot of different icons, frescoes, you know, and different um, statues of uh, rulers or European rulers. And you could clearly see that they had woolly afros. You could clearly see they had the wide nose, the big lips, so on and so forth. All right. So it says of intellectual darkness in Europe between the fall of Rome and the Renaissance, which the fall of Rome, which were Edomites ruling prior to that. When Jay came in, they're trying to say that that was a dark ages, you know. You know, because there was, you know, because according to Esau, Jake never created anything. Every great invention, every great thing ever came from the Edomites, which is total bullshit. Scriptures say that Jacob is the former of all things. And uh, between, the, between the fall of Rome and the Renaissance, that became especially popular during the 18th century age of enlightenment. enlightenment. Others, however, have used the term to denote the relative ignorance of historians regarding at least the early part of the Middle Ages from a scarcity of records, right? Because just because you don't have a whole lot of documentation doesn't mean that you didn't have other stuff going on. You didn't have artwork and imagery because when Esau took over, right? They have a term called iconoclasm, which is a compound word. Icon meaning image, clasm meaning destruction. So if during the Renaissance period, they also had a period of iconoclasm, right? Which they defaced the dark images that were all throughout Europe. If there was no form of art, or if there was no uh, intellectual, you know, things going on during the so-called dark ages, where did all these images come from that Esau used to, uh, to, uh, um, to destroy or deface those images from? Where did they come from? You know? Were they always there? You know? And if that's the case, why did they destroy those images? Why did they break the noses off? Why did they paint white over all of those over all those images? And brothers, right on time. First Maccabee 3 and 48. And laid open the book of the law, wherein the heathen had sought to paint the likeness of their images. Right. This happened during the Greeks, the Greek Empire. And it also happened during the Dark Ages. I'm sorry, after the Dark Ages, during the time of the Renaissance. All right, and that was that dark period of a thousand years where Esau was, was kept closed off to the world. He had a dark cloud over him. Just like today, we have the curses over us. That is our dark cloud that will not allow Jake to advance, but so far, until the Lord removes that cup and, and, and uh, uh, renews us. Okay, so going back to Revelation 20 and 2, and he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Most people think that this is talking about the spiritual demon Satan. It is not. All right, this is talking about the Edomites. The seven heads and ten horns is talking about the Edomites. And this, this is why it says, the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, because the devil is means a uh, um, slanderer. The word Satan or the name Satan means adversary, and they have been the the uh, the um, slanderers and adversaries to the Most High and to the nation of Israel. You know, for that period of a thousand years. I'm sorry, that after that thousand year period, and from the time of the Renaissance until now there has been a great deception that has took place upon the planet Earth. When you go to Revelation, the 17th chapter, right, it explains to you who the, the seven heads and ten horns are. It's talking about kings. It's talking about nations ruling on the Earth. And the reason why they put the label of red on it is because red is synonymous with Edom. Edom is a name that Esau was given Esau being a so-called white man and his descendants became the Edomites and the word Edom from the Hebrew word Adawam which means red 
and that's why it was known as a great red dragon because it was the Edomites that were ruling so it was seven uh, empires of Esau beginning with the Greeks ending with the uh, with the British all right and and uh and uh, Russia had no parts in that. You know, you had the Greeks, the Romans, the French, the Spanish, Germanian Major, Germanian Minor, and Britain. And out of those seven came the eighth, which is America. And it breaks that down for you. It speaks about seven mountains. Mountains represent governments, major governments of these Edomites that, they, that the Lord gave them the power to conquer the known world at the time. Today, with, through America, they've conquered the whole no, the whole world, all right, which America is the eighth head of all of those. And this is why they carry the beast. That's one of the ways they carry the beast. All right, so when we jump down, and then when you go back to Revelation 17, it breaks down that, that the, those seven heads and the ten horns are pretty much a, a conglomerate, fancy where you can look it up, of Edomite nations together ruling jointly, and the ten horns are... 10 European allies of America. All right? It says, verse 3, Revelation 20, verse 3, and cast him into the bottomless pit, meaning in Europe itself, because Jake was ruling in Europe and Esau was in captivity under Jake. And they were shut up. They couldn't do anything about it. You have a, a book that was brought out um, by the high priest Yeshai, as his name was back then, you know, and there was one caption of a picture that says, A day in the king's court. And what did you have? You had Jake rulers, judges, sitting on benches, and you had Edomites being brought before criminal tribunals or, crimi uh, or criminal court, being charged just like they do Jake today in the, in the modern day courts. And cast them into the bottomless pit and shut them up. When you shut somebody up, they can't get out. You have that key, which we read in the first verse. That's that key of the bottomless pit. All right? It says, and set a seal upon him. So not only were they shut up, but a seal was set upon them, meaning they had, you know, a, a um, spiritual block set upon them by the Lord where they couldn't do anything. And brother, once again, Job, the water, Job 9.24, the earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covered the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? So if the Edomites didn't do this, because who, 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 whose images do you see plastered all over the place as being the Most High, being Yahweh Shai, being the Israelites, the angels, so on and so forth. And if you're being honest, you have to say, well, it's the white man's image. The, the Chinese people, the African people, the different nation peoples, they didn't go around the world painting themselves as the Heavenly Father and the Messiah and the angels and the people of the Lord. You white people did that, okay? Inside joke, but true. You know? So you are the slanderers you are the adversary you are that serpent that was an actual man in the garden that deceived Eve all right so verse 3 again and cast him into the uh, into the bottomless pit and, uh, and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should what deceive the nations no more because that's what Esau does he covered the faces of the judges there what is that covering who the Most High is, who Yahweh Shai is, who the angels are, who the Israelites are, and putting their face on there. Till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that, he should be loosed a little season. And we're in that little season from the Renaissance period until now. And if you continue to read now the next verse, you'll be confused because you're thinking that this is talking about the same time period, but it's not. It's a, there's a jump cut here. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump to, to continue the, 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 the thought to the seventh verse. Because remember, the last part of that verse says, uh, uh, until, the, until the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he shall be loosed a little season. So what happened when he was loosed a little season? That little season is the Renaissance period. Okay? It says, and when the thousand years are expired, that is the first thousand years from roughly around 325 AD until the time when the Renaissance started to take place, which was around the mid 1300s into the 1400s and, and beyond. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Why? Because the Lord took that blocker off. He took that dark veil off, that dark 
cloud off of him because he has a mission to fulfill. And now in this mission that he has to fulfill, he's moving forward, all right? And, and to what you see today. So we're at the point now that the deception is still brewing, but now he's at the point where his technology has increased and he is about to establish his so-called New World Order, which is his, his agenda, which is gonna bring an end to him. Everything that the Most High done to this devil, you know, is to, for his, to, to his demise. Because the Lord said he would set them in slippery places. All right? And every time they, they come up with a so-called invention, or they come up with a way to, to uh, con has, con maintain control over the world, there's always something that has to do with violence to his sword. When the Lord gave him the technology of the missiles, that was a technology he used to puff at the nations with, but that is the very instrument that the Most High, Yahweh Bashem El Shai is going to use to bring an end to this devil. The Lord, just like the Lord gave him the technology to establish, you know, this this uh, this this uh, system that they got going on, uh, a digital global system, and that is going to help them push forward their agenda, which is the New World Order. And that agenda, the New World Order, when they implement that and, and get it in place to a certain degree, that's what also we're going to bring their end. So that the sword that they use to, to conquer the world and to punish the world with is the same sword that the Most High is going to use to destroy them with. How do you like them apples? So, back in Revelation 27, And when a thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and he and shall go out to what? To deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. And this is exactly what he's done, and this is exactly where we're at today in prophecy. Right? It says, Gog and Magog. And it just so happens to mention Russia. Because Russia is the key figure that the Most High is going to use to destroy these devils. This is that bear in the book of Revelation, the 13th chapter, roughly around the second verse. All right? And Russia, along with her allies, you know, and the allies of America are going to be the ones to shoot missiles upon this place. You know? It says, uh, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. This is the Valley of Jehoshaphat, Armageddon, which Lord's will, I, I want to do a, a separate lesson for this verse here. And uh, this separate lesson, Lord's will, that I could do for this verse here will go hand in hand with the missing verses of Revelation 12 that I didn't go over in the first lesson because I wanted to do a separate lesson on that. So all of this is going to tie together. So Yahweh Bashim El Shai Ratiza, I could do that, you know, and, and put all that together because that is a great battle of Armageddon. You know, it's a great battle where Esau and the nations are going to be fighting in the air and Yahweh Shai and the angels are going to come and take them out. You know, that is that, you know, battle in, in, in uh, heaven between the Yahweh Shai, Michael, the archangel, the angels, and Esau and their angels, which are their technology, you know, their stealth bombers, you know, missiles, all of that. They're going to get crushed like a worm inside joke. Bear, bear with me one second. So, verse 9, it says, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints. The breadth of the earth and the camp of the saints, that's Israel, Jerusalem, because that is, you know, that is our land that is being occupied by who? By the heathen, you know? Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And we're coming to that fulfillment. And when that's fulfilled, Yahweh Shai is going to come and take his rightful place back on that throne and kick the devil, Esau, off of that throne. That's why he said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Because they are up in the clouds, up in the heavens, with their planes and all that, fighting each other. They're going to try to fight the Lord, and they're going to be smoked. And never again will these devils ever go up into uh, uh, the air like that. That's why it says their place was no more found in heaven. You see? 
And these wacky tacky Christians, they teach that that's talking about Satan rebelled against the Most High, him and his angels, because he was a beautiful angel that was full of music and, you know, he got jealous of the Most High and then there was a rivalry and he was, you know, looking at the Most High sideways. And then, you know, he was like, as he was looking at the Most High sideways and plotting on him, you know, he was like looking at other individuals, spirits up there, and he said, yeah, I can get that one, this one, this one, this one. He'd go over there and, and conversate with them and convince them to get on his side. And the third of the angels came and plotted against the Most High, and the Most High came and kicked Satan in the ass, and all the minions flew down with him onto the ground. <laughs> so like I'm just, you know, and animating it a little bit, but it's a joke. That's a fable, a myth. You see, that's why what the Apostle Peter said, when we made known to you the mysteries of Yahushai, we didn't use, you know, those cunningly devised fables. I'm just uh, merely paraphrasing. Yeah, the Mormon BS, like the brother Gabar Yahweh said. All right, so it says, um, and the beloved city, which is Jerusalem, and fire came down from heaven, I'm sorry, from the Most High out of heaven, and devour them. This is what's going to cause that lake of fire. Because you're going to have the missiles shot and you're going to have the lasers from the chariot. It's going to make it hot. You know? And that's why Yahweh said, I am come to bring fire on the earth and what will I if it be already kindled? So it says, And the devil that deceived them, which is Esau and all his cohorts, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the fire that the Most High is going to cause to come down, which shows you that these individuals at the IUIC teaching that the that, that lake of fire is a place where you go burn forever, they're bugged out. Because it said the Most High is going to make that fire come down from the heavens. And when that fire comes down from the heavens, you know, it says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of, lake of fire and brimstone. It's not a place you go and burn forever. They must have hit that dude with a lovely bag or lovely bags for him to start teaching that bullshit. And just when you think they're, they're on the straight and narrow, they're starting to come around, warming up to the MOTB being the micro C hip. You know, the whole digital system they're talking about. You know, they, 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 you know they're trying to line their ducks in a row or however you, the, 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 the term goes. You know, all of a sudden, they took a left turn at Albuquerque. It's like, what the fuck? It says, uh, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Right, because it, this place is going to be burning for a long time. A long time, Tony. It's going to be burning for a long time. That's why it says forever and ever. You know, it's going to be for, for a certain period of time. You're not going to be able to quench it because there's not going to be no holes or no fire truck or a ladder tall enough or strong enough to put this out. It's going to go out on its own eventually. You see? It says, um, and I saw a great white throne. So this is that great white throne of judgment, as, as you know, they call it. Right? And him that sat on it, which is the Most High Yahweh, Bashem Yahweh Shai, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, meaning that this wicked earth, the rulership of it, is what's going to flee away. Because the Lord is going to come and bring righteousness and reestablish righteousness on the earth. So the world right now, the face of it, is going to be changed. It's going to have another face. Uh, and the heaven fled away, meaning Esau's heaven. And there was found no place for them. And that's why when you read 2 Peter, the third chapter, it speaks about a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. We know that the new heaven and the new earth is not going to be an actual new one because in Ecclesiastes 1 and 4, it says that the earth abideth forever. Now, let's go from there real quick to the book of Daniel, chapter 7 and verse 9. This is also the great white throne judgment. Daniel 7 and 9, I beheld to the thrones were cast down. What thrones? The thrones of the heathens, the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So those thrones, which are the rulerships of the other nations, beginning with Esau, are going to be thrown down by the Most High through his son, Yahweh Shai, when he comes back to conquer as a, as a uh, king of kings and the Lord of lords. 
right? It says, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool, because the Most High Yahweh is a so-called black man with what with a super dark royal chocolate colored skin with a white woolly afro. All right. Get that through your thick skull. And it doesn't even use the word white for his for his uh, hair in this. You know, but we know he's the ancient of days. It says, Like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, that's the chariots, and his wheels as burning fire, that's the lights from the chariots, emanating from the chariots. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, which is lasers, Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, which are the angels, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was open. I'm sorry, the judgment was set, and the books were open, meaning everything that's written in the book in that day will be fulfilled as far as judgment is concerned. And everybody's going, you know, everybody's going to get their just due. Those that have done the right thing, you know, of the Israelites to the everlasting life, those that have done the wrong things, of the Israelites to destruction. But they'll come back through the ones that make it, the elect. All right? And the other nations, all nations that are on the planet Earth are not going to be destroyed. The people that are going to be destroyed, for the most part, are everyone on the soils of America, Babylon the Great, and the soils of Israel, the land of Israel, and certain parts of the Earth that, that get hit by these missiles. You know? But as a whole, you're going to have people around because the scriptures say that when the destruction comes, you're still going to have those that don't repent of their murders and sorceries and all of that. So the earth is not going to be destroyed because where the hell are they going to go? They're just going to be floating in space. I don't repent. I don't repent. But the earth is blowed up, right? You see how stupid that sounds? All right, so now let's go back to Revelation chapter 20 where we left off at. All right, Revelation chapter 20. And... I read 11 again. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from, who, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Right, because this, the, the uh, wicked system that's ruling is not going to be ruling anymore. And I saw the dead, small and great stand before the Most High because everyone's going to be judged in that day. And the books were open, which is the scriptures. And another book was open, which is the book of life, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things which were written in the books according to their works. Right. And there's not going to be a whole line of people, you know, let's say at that day if there's 9 billion people on the earth or 10 billion or whatever, they're all going to be lined up and the Lord's going to go through them one by one and call out all their deeds and punish them. No. It's going to be all at the same time. Suddenly, that judgment is going to come. The ones that are Israelites that are part of the elect will be delivered and the rest are going to be severely dealt with inside joke but true it says and the sea gave up the dead because you have a lot of dead uh, um, you know jakes and, and different people that have died in the seas and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them yeah because the grave is no longer you know going to hold the the, uh, the uh, bones you know for lack of better words of these people that died they're going to come right up. Their spirit is going to go into them and they're going to come right up. You know, the, uh, the elect are going to go right into the chariots. It says, uh, which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Right. It says, and death and the hell were cast into the lake of fire. That's what? That's the destruction. America is going to be totally engulfed in flames. You shall perish in flames. This is the second death. It's telling you what it is. The lake of fire is not no place you go and burn forever. Some pit that you go and burn forever. You know? It's the destruction. And it's the reason why I call it the second death. Because the first death was what? The flood. This is the second judgment. And this is going to be remembered far greater than the deliverance from Egypt. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So we come to the end of the chapter, which begins the beginning of the kingdom, which begins the beginning of the second thousand year period 
in this same chapter. So we'll jump to the fourth verse now, and this is the, the, the continuing uh, thought pattern, so to speak, of after this destruction and everybody's judged, this is what's going to go down. And I saw thrones, and they, and they sat upon them. Why? Because the kingdom will be established. The, uh, the, um, the uh, apostles will be sitting on thrones. The 144,000 are going to be sitting on thrones. You know, Israel is going to be ruling, right? It says, and judgment was given unto them. Why? Because the saints shall judge the world. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Yahweh Shai. Those are the ones that died, you know, defending the gospel. And for the word of the Most High, and which had not worshipped the beast, right? They didn't bow down to the image of Baal, neither his image, neither had received his M-A-R-K upon their foreheads or in their hands, which is the micro hip a very controversial topic which some individuals are trying to, you know, scrape and scratch to try to make it uh, uh, something else than what it is. It says, and they live and reign with Yahweh Shai a thousand years after the destruction of Esau and the nations and this wicked kingdom and the kingdom being reestablished. This is that next period of the thousand years. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished because after that thousand year period in the kingdom, <coughs> then the nations that are going to be in captivity are going to be, are going to in, be in their lands rule among themselves but they're still going to be tributary to us okay they're going to you know uh, uh, have a little more freedom a little more leeway but they're still going to be tribu tributary to us and they're still going to uphold the law statutes and commandments that they're going to learn during that thousand year period all right it says but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished this has nothing to do with with uh jake this is talking about the nations because the Israelites that don't make it on this trip are going to come back in the kingdom through the elect that make it. This is the first resurrection, meaning the first dominion that is going to be the first rulership of the Israelites, beginning with the first fruits. The first fruits are the first rulers, the, cho the, choice, the choicest grapes of the vine. So you can understand. This is Micah chapter 4. And verse 8, And thou, O tower of the flock, which are what? The prophets, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come even the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. That's why Yahweh has said, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. All right? So going back to... Um, Revelation 20, let's read 5 again. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. What is the first resurrection? The, the elect of the nation of Israel ruling with Yahweh Shai. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Right. The ones that make it on the first trip. On such the second death has no power. See? And the second death is what? The destruction. But they shall be priests of the Most High and Yahweh Shai, which we're going to be kings and priests, read Revelation 5, and shall reign with him a thousand years. This is a second thousand year period in the kingdom of heaven. Esau, once he goes down, he ain't coming back up again. It's over. Sakabo. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations. That's going backwards. No, the, the uh, sentiment of the kingdom of heaven in the thousand years ends with the sixth verse. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of the Most High and of Yahweh Shai, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And like I said, Lord's will, I can uh, do the lesson with uh, Revelation 20, verse 7. You know, on down, you know, mainly the 8th verse and tie that in with Revelation 12 and 9 and other precepts that's going to bring about this global Armageddon, you know, which is the final war. The word Armageddon, Harmagadwan, Har is mount, uh, God is troop, and one makes it plural, Harmagadwan, mountain of the troops. That is the assembly of all these diff different uh, militaries of these nations coming to fight against each other and eventually war against Yahweh Shai and the angels and they will lose miserably. And Esau will no more be found ever to rule. 
So with that, I pray that you brothers and few sisters have been edified. To the next time I say, Shalom.